There was a mixed reaction to the budget speech delivered by Tito Mboweni yesterday, but cautious optimism seems to be the overriding emotion. My colleague Fifi Peters was out and about and duty bound to get voices and analysis that dissect the minister's first full-blown budget. See how, if you can spot some of Fifi's associations on the parliament steps stemming from her Davos friend. I think, you know, if you're a realist, you know our country's been through an incredibly difficult period over the last number of years, and the economy is in a really tough place right now. And as a result of that, the budget's always going to be a mix of difficult compromises. So I don't think it had enough pro-growth initiatives in the budget. But that said, I think the budget was positive in terms of commitments to reform of SARS, commitments to state-owned enterprise reform, although I don't think enough is still being done around ESKIM, and commitments to reduction in the public sector wage bill. But I don't think it did enough around pro-growth reforms. What would you have liked to see around ESKIM? So I think that this is probably the start of a process that is going to take longer to resolve ESKIM's challenges. Uh, 23 billion rand a year is a fraction of their interest bill on an annual basis. So it does mean that tariffs are likely to go up considerably into the, into the future. So I, I think we need a, a much quicker acceleration of the structural reforms in ESKIM around breaking ESKIM up because we do simply have too many eggs in one basket. I like the, what he mentioned about uh, asking the question, do we need the state-owned ent entities? And if we need them, why do we need them? Can we make them run more efficiently? So I think all those are good questions. Uh, he is obviously operating in a very difficult environment. The economy is struggling. Um, but given the conditions that he had to work with, I think he presented a very good budget. Even though there's no express allocation to SA, but there is a framework within which the challenge of transforming SOCs will be addressed. So for us, we feel comfortable with that. So it's, it's, to me, it's, it's, it's less about give me some more, it's about let's transform the business, be more accountable, make sure you've got a plan that will deliver results, and that's what we have at SA. The minister did say that, you know, ESCOM made the debt. ESCOM needs to pay off its own debt. I just want to ask for you, how much would you like to achieve within your role as, as the chairperson? How much of that debt would you like to chip off ESCOM's shoulder? Look, I think the most important thing now, we need to, our focus has to be providing reliable electricity for the country, for the economy, uh, within the constraints of what we can afford. The chief reorganization officer, what do you make about that announcement, a sort of curator for ESCOM? Well, uh, as uh, the minister said, uh, apparently it's done in the private sector. So we will have to wait and see all those details. We do understand that uh, the problems at ESCOM are just now so massive. It is not going to be ESCOM alone that can solve them. There were increases in, in, in spending for social services. I, I think that, that uh, education again and some of the fundamental issues we need to do was addressed. The public sector compensation, I think absolutely clear that we need to do something about it. There, there's a phased approach towards that. We don't have too much choice in raising income, so we've got to look at expenditure. And I think he's doing that in a responsible way. And he started by saying his job is not politics, his job is to manage the finances of the country. Now the criticism of this budget is that it's not as investor friendly as it should be, particularly the investment drive that the government is going on. It's more for, for the workers, for the working class. I mean, what's your response to this? No, my response to that is, is uh, not taking into account the conditions under which we operate. At the moment, as you can see, the minister made reference to the fact that we, in fact, down in revenue by 15 billion rand. Therefore, the environment is not favorable for us to make a kind of any, a better incentive package. But there's a lot that has come out in industrialization, in the economic regulation side, in the form of incentives. It does indicate a commitment to turning things around. Uh, which is a good signal for investment, but it also does indicate that things are tough and, and therefore we need to make hard choices. And I think it depends on what people do beyond this point. Thanks. Mr. 
Jonas, just lastly, it also indicates that, you know, uh, government's debt is growing. I mean, they've moved the, the expenditure ceiling. Uh, the debt is expected to stabilize at a later stage. These are all uh, red flags for a possible ratings downgrade for Moody's. I mean, are you worried? Look, I mean, most of the issues that we're facing are not short-term issues. And, uh, and they are structural, so it will take time to get over it. I think the important thing is that there is an underlying commitment to deal with the issues. Well, um, I think I'm rather inspired by what the Minister had to say. Um, it's all about knuckling down. It's all about planting that seed and being committed. So I'm encouraged by the priority areas that he mentioned. Um, and I think this is a positive budget, a budget that we all need to restore the country. Any red flags for you in this budget? Um, no, no red flags in particular. I think I would have liked to hear a bit more detail about some of the investment initiatives that, um, that the minister has in mind, about how those pledges of 300 billion that were um, announced at the investment conference last year would be would be allocated, would be spent. Um, but I'm sure further detail will follow following today. What kind of growth initiatives would you have liked to see? Yeah, so I think, you know, certainly uh, commitments to, to, for example, we talk about visas. We've been talking about visas for two or three years and there's no real change on the ground. So we need something's going to be done by a particular date. I think it would have been really good to see something spoken about around special economic zones, uh, something spoken about around specific tax incentives for investments and growth. So I think there's a plethora of things that could still have been done. I mean... You were chair of Telcom when Telcom went through its privatization process. What's stopping ESCOM from doing the same and also coming out to become a darling like Telcom is? Look, uh, these are, uh, the one thing common about them is the COM, but they are very different environment. The Telcom uh, is much smaller. Uh, if Telcom did not get through, uh, you had other uh, telephone uh, and uh, other providers. ESCOM uh, is too key, is too systemic, it's big. Uh, ESCOM, if it was a listed company, it would have been one of the biggest companies uh, on the stock exchange. It touches every aspect of our lives. The problems at ESCOM have been going on for too long. They are too deep, they are too big. They would need a lot of pain, tears and sweat for us to get out of here. I will not. Uh, see in my tenure a fully uh, turned around ESCOM, but I hope I would have been part of a team that have uh, started to push the needle. And you know, there was a bit of concern that raising excise duties further on cigarettes could actually encourage even more illegal trading in this space. What's your response to this? Watch this space. Uh, we are addressing that scourge that is defrauding the fiscus of money. We are taking it on. We're going to continue to address it. My teams are out in the field as we speak, uh, dealing with it, and we're going to continue to do that. We're, we're going to win on this, on this front. Yes, there'll always be some smuggling and people not paying the rightful portion, but the key thing is that we're making inroads into it, and we are going to do that. I mean, how long, how long more? Um, should we wait or, do, or does South Africa have to wait to see SARS back in its former glory, collecting the kind of revenue that actually meets targets and doesn't get downgraded like we just heard today, we're expecting even a bigger revenue shortfall than we got in the October uh, estimate? Well, as you're aware, some of the revenue shortfall relates to refunds where we were catching up. So as we're sitting here today, the revenue, the, the, the credit book for VAT has dropped below uh, uh, 24 billion. So we made significant inroads, which obviously impacts on government's revenue, but it's good news for the economy, as the minister said. How long it's going to take, I don't know, but we are committed. As an organization, we've got excellent people. we committed to do what's right to fix the place. You see, Honorable Minister of Finance, Tito Mbowen, is a clever black. He's touched on all the things that business was praying for. First and foremost, it's about stopping the bleeding that is occasioned by state capture, bribery, stealing and cheating and corruption. Number two, it's about ensuring that we reduce our total debt. Number three is to ensure that we fix ESCOM because when ESCOM succeeds, the whole of the country succeeds and the corollary is also true. Uh, it achieved to me three things. I may add the fourth dimension to it. The first one was spelled off our, our strategy in terms of restructuring state-owned enterprise. Secondly, we've stated that on course in relation to fiscal consolidation. And thirdly, we are putting the economy back, back on, a growth, on a growth path in terms of 
uh, increasing infrastructure spending. And then on a lighter note, we're beginning to continue with the redistributive approach. I mean, the big headline obviously was ESCOM. Everybody was waiting to see what would be mentioned and how this turnaround strategy could possibly be implemented. My question to you is, I mean, how can it not be implemented without cost savings and efficiency savings and that unfortunately in the form of labor given a lot of criticism on the headcount of ESCOM? There are different ways of doing that. We have seen that in the public sector in particular. Lastly, it is going to happen through natural attrition and voluntary retrenchment. So those are tools that are better managed without conflictual uh, relationships. And, uh, you know, Mr. Kodongwana, I was in the media briefing with the, the governor, governor number eight, governor number ten, as they like to call themselves. Yeah. Once again, the issue of the independence of the Reserve Bank came out. Once again, they described it as sacrosanct in contradiction to the ANC stance on nationalization. No, 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 no. So. I'm the only person who first used the, the, the formulation sacrosanct in, in the National General Council. So the Sankrosant formulation is an NC one. We reaffirm that the independence of the River Bank remains entrenched. And people confuse two things. Two things, the running of the monetary policy and the ownership of the Reserve Bank. The ownership of the Reserve Bank is not even catered for in the Constitution. So nationalization relates to one part of which is nationalization. It's come going forward, many say can't continue with the amount of workers that it currently has. Can you give us any insights into what you plan to do with your ballooned headcount? Uh, I think also we have to implement government policy. We state owned. Uh, the shareholder in chief has already drawn a line on the sand as to which are no go zones. So we need to continue to try and find other ways. We have uh, started in the areas where we can uh, to try and uh, look at our operational costs. And finally, I mean, ESCOM is quite active in the, the financial markets. Uh, just give us a sense of how you have been received and how you're expecting to be received by potential uh, new bond investors after this, this budget. I think by and large there's been uh, big support and thanks to all the South African banks and all the international uh, bond uh, holders that have backed us. So there's been uh, a renewed support and uh, however that support is not going to be uh, evergreen. It's going to be conditional on us having to come to the party on the cost and the revenue side. I actually think the finance minister dealt very admirably with the challenges before him. There was no adventurism in his response. It was, I think, very much seizing the moment and holding the line. If you think of the debt to GDP number, effectively went from 59 to 60 percent, and the fiscal deficit went from 4.2 to 4.5 percent. So this is obviously a weakening picture of low growth numbers for South Africa. We have to get growth up. To get our growth up, we have to have structural reform. And I think effectively investors, rating agencies and the public have to look at the May election and say to themselves, what kind of mandate will the president have to the extent he is re-elected uh, to undertake the structural reforms? And obviously the higher mandate he has and the more effective an administration he can put of his own making in uh, to place to accelerate those reforms, the better the economic outputs will be. But for now, this was a great job holding the line on the budget. That's all we had for this edition of Political Capital. We are back on your screen next Tuesday at 6.30 with state capture testimony as we zone in on the malfeasance at State Utility ESCOM. Until Tuesday at 6.30, keep it right here.